Hi, my name is Blake Robbins, and you're listening to the Tomorrow with Rovio podcast. Hey, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Tomorrow with Rovio podcast. As always, I'm your host, Ben Mattis, and I have today with me Blake Robbins. Uh, Blake has a really interesting perspective on the world of the creator. So the YouTube content creators who have the channels, the Twitch streamers, the TikTok uh, influencers, the whole quote unquote passion economy is a world he knows better than many. And we spent a good hour and a half talking about why these people create, how they create, what they get out of it, what we get out of it, what the kids get out of it, and and sort of what the business model is. How do these guys make money? What are they looking for in a game? What are they looking for in a partner? Uh, and a bit about sort of where he thinks that relationship is going, the, the sort of relationship between creators and, and, and the games that they use to create their videos and to create their streams. So do give this podcast a listen if any of this stuff is interesting to you. If you've heard of Mr. Beast and want to know how he got so big, if you've heard of Ninja, if you've heard of, you know, sort of uh, some of these bigger content creators, Preston and that sort of thing, and you want a, a better understanding of how these people sort of got as big as they got, Blake Robbins is a great person to help explain all of that to you. Um, and we dive into that in this episode. I hope you enjoy it. All right, let's jump in. Let's get started. Uh, Blake, nice to meet you. This is our first time meeting each other. Hopefully it won't be the last. Um, okay. And I guess let's start with the introductions. Um, you do a fair amount of blogging, tweeting, podcasting, sort of, et cetera. Um, maybe just help us understand kind of who are you? What are you known for? What, 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 do you, what gets you excited? What, what, do you, what do you vibe on? Uh, and obviously it can be stuff above and beyond what you, you tweet about if, and, and podcast about if, if, if you want. Yeah, no. Well, thank you for, for having me on. I mean, I think for me, I, I spend my time, I, I, I guess maybe just taking a step back. Like I feel like in a lot of ways I was, I was born and raised on the internet and, uh, like I, <laughs> You're not I, alone. I, I grew up in, you know, the suburbs of Detroit and, and I feel like that was, I don't know, but for some reason I just always spent time on the internet and maybe it's just my age and, and just the era that I was raised in, but I just always loved just hanging out on like old school internet forums and discovering random niche areas of the internet. And I eventually discovered gaming uh, when I was in like middle school or high school, specifically like uh, multiplayer gaming. Yeah, that was always sure. the, the thing that I loved. And uh, I just shooters fell in or love something with, was our yeah, particular yeah, specifically yeah. Call of Duty, Call of Duty and like yeah. Halo and that nice. world. Yeah. Uh, I just became obsessed and I, I just went super, super deep in, into that world and and to the point where, you know, I was like, I wanted to be a professional gamer. I remember telling my parents that that I wanted to go pro in, in Call of Duty or Halo and they were just like, you're insane. That's not a thing. <laughs> uh, and, <laughs> and so, you know, that world is very near and dear to me and I still to this day love, you know, going really deep in that and, and yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I love esports and gaming and, and literally anything around gaming. That could be mobile gaming. That could be PC gaming. I, I'm just a gaming fanatic. And then I'm also really, you know, the other part of growing up on the Internet is I, I've sort of always uh, watched YouTube and Twitch and, and this world where uh, I, I always felt like influencers had a bad rep, if, if that makes sense. Like okay. just the traditional influencers that we think of, most people... Uh, I don't know if you're not in that world, just sort of look at it and they're like, ah, okay. Like they're just like shilling random things and, yeah. uh, that they're, they're just being like, I don't know, bad people or whatever. And, and trying for to get me, free I, stuff or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like <clears throat> it, it just didn't seem a lot of people look at it and they're just like, what is this? You know, like, uh, they don't understand. But for me, I, I always sort of got it because I watched a lot of these people and I was like weirdly a fan of a lot of these people. And so, uh, when I got into, to venture capital, I was just like, it just feels like there's a missed opportunity here because they still feel like their, their influence isn't really understood, like to the level that, that everyone else, you know, people acknowledge that they're influential, but 
it still feels like they're they're even more influential than 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 people realize, and uh, they're really building amazing audiences around them. And so for me, I just became obsessed with the creator world as well, and how specifically like how individuals can make businesses, you know, and yes. and, and it's like this new type of small business in, in my mind. Uh, and and most of these aren't actually small businesses. I mean, if you're top creator, you're making millions of dollars, but uh, they are running businesses. They just don't realize it yet. And so yeah. uh, in in a a lot of ways I, i'm just really fascinated by that world as well so uh again uh, tons of questions for you about the you know creator ecosystem i guess is the best way to put it um uh and and some questions for you about esports as well but before we get into that um can you talk just a little bit about you said venture capital before i got into venture capital so just so people know what you do can you talk a little bit about your <laughs> 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 about that yeah for sure, yeah. So, my, I mean, my day job is is I'm an investor at a, a venture fund called Ludlow Ventures. We're we're a small team of three, uh, okay. based out of uh, Detroit. And yeah, I mean, we're we're a forty five fifty million dollar fund that invests at the earliest stages of of companies, and okay. uh, we invest all across the board in terms of types of companies. I, mainly, software is really the, the the core piece, but enterprise, consumer, gaming, you know, all of that is is right in our wheelhouse. And we spend time in a lot, a lot of different areas. But the the key thing is that we're betting on people at sort of the earliest earliest stages. And yep. uh, yeah, we we've, we've we've been around for about a decade so far oh, wow. and, and it's been a it's been a really fun ride so far that's awesome i i feel like there's a whole podcast episode to be to be done just on gaming venture capital i f- i feel like five years ago in gaming trying to raise vc was hard <laughs> maybe yes um and and i know from practice i know from experience because i was trying to do it um, you know, there there wasn't a huge laundry list of VCs who sort of actively advertised gaming as one of their, you know, major kind of portfolio strategies. I think it's probably safe to say that that's evolved somewhat in the last five years. Um, yes. I think if today you were to make a list of VCs who who plug gaming as kind of like a core competency and an investment thesis or, or component of their investment thesis, it would it would probably be a much longer list than it was five years ago. Um, and everything that's just gone into that transition, I think would be a fascinating, a fascinating episode. So I don't know. Let's, oh, let's, I agree. let's put a pin <laughs> on that. We can talk about that one later. Cause I'd, I'd love to pick your brains on sort of what are some of the things that led to that shift. But if people Absolutely. are tuning into this episode to listen to Blake talk about VC, I'm sorry, you're going to have to wait to a later episode. But if you want to hear Blake talk about creative, creator economics, creators, esports, this is the episode for you. <laughs> um, okay, so so let's dive into to the the creator ecosystem. So you've got a podcast called uh, Creator Economics. I was listening to it um, for a few weeks, and then uh, I listened to yes the episode you guys launched yesterday that just totally blew my mind. Um, can you talk a little bit about that podcast and sort of, I guess, why? why you started to start that particular podcast. And because it's not, it's not so much just creators, although obviously you, you touch upon that, but it's the economics behind the, the creator ecosystem. And I thought that that was a really interesting angle. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. And, and, and really, it, it started mainly out of my co-host, Reed, uh, is, is the manager for uh, Mr. Beast and uh, Preston and, and a bunch of other really big, YouTube creators. And I'd gotten to know him, I don't know, maybe two years ago or something like that. And and we just would text and talk back and forth about a lot of this stuff. And, uh, and, and I, and one day we were just like, why don't we just start a podcast? Like we talk about this, you know, every day, we should just uh, start talking about it more and more and, and be public with our thoughts. And I'm already fairly public with my thoughts on this space on, on Twitter, but uh, we felt like there was sort of a missing opportunity to just talk about it on, on YouTube as well, because in a lot of ways, the the stuff that we're talking about, the audience is probably more, I don't know, business people or creators themselves or aspiring creators or managers or just anyone on, on more of the business side. Because again, I, I think a lot of these creators 
uh, today or you know for the past decade were, were purely thinking of themselves as like talent and they weren't thinking of themselves as like a business and yep. i think that we are uh going through a pretty big shift right now where where creators are realizing like wow uh i actually have a lot of influence i have a really engaged audience and they're finally asking like what can i build for myself you know or or what can i build for my audience uh which is just a really interesting a paradigm shift, you know, versus before when they're just like, okay, I'm just going to take whatever the biggest brand deal is and, exactly. and I'm just going to promote that. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, um, I, I do have some questions d- diving into that and I will use, you know, Mr. Beast a, a, as an example, because I, I, I think a lot of people or an increasing number of people have probably heard the name and, and begun to recognize that, you know, he sort of, he sort of represents a seismic <laughs> shift um, in, in this idea of the creator as a business and the kinds of things that they can do. So I, I think we'll have some really interesting conversations about that. But so you've been doing this podcast for a year or so, I think, mm-hmm. maybe. Yep. Um, and you've been thinking about this for years. Yep. My feeling is that most people probably listening to this podcast, in fact, probably a lot of people in the industry, including, again, like people like myself, who like theoretically should know this stuff, we probably don't really get creators, let alone the economics of it. Um, your episode yesterday about the, uh, you know, how kids, how teens are making millions off of Minecraft servers, it, it you know, I, I had heard the kind of tales from the trenches, but it 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 still blew my mind, right? It it and we were just talking about this before the episode. Like some of these stories about these teenagers, you know, paying their way through college and then some basically with a couple of, you know, really skins that they made that kind of blew up or or a Minecraft server or something like that or YouTube. Um it it it's astronomical. And what I think would be really interesting is Can you share some sort of facts or stories or like tales from the trenches to help people wrap their heads around this space? Like like when we say creator and the fact that creators are making money and that creators are becoming a business, and I don't need dollars and cents, right? But can you just help us kind of explore a little bit some of the crazy stories that you've heard over the last few years as it relates to kind of creators and some of the cool stuff they're doing? Yeah, for sure. I, I I mean, I think it's, you know, the story that you touched on that, that we covered on the podcast uh, was was about uh, a big creator named Preston. Uh, and, and he's, uh, you know, worthy of, a, you know, a full episode uh, alone because he just is such a crazy creator and that he has you know, five plus YouTube channels. He continues to upload to all of those regularly. Uh, but he something that he did, and and I think it fits really nicely into this example, is is the Minecraft server piece where okay. uh, he became, he was, he was sort of the, I don't, I don't know how deep you've gone into the Minecraft YouTuber world, but... Uh, my, my son's 11. Okay, all right, all right. So then then you you have to understand it to some level where like yes. there is... Uh, <laughs> there there That is, for me was a mic drop. That for me yeah. was like, I'm relatively deep. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's been, you know, there there's been sort of waves of, of Minecraft YouTubers over the past, yes. uh, I don't know, call it decade even, I don't know, or five, 10 years where... Uh, Preston was sort of one of the first big Minecraft creators, and okay. uh, he was really unique in that he understood uh, there was this opportunity to build a bigger business around himself. He started to see these server companies pop up for Minecraft, you know, to play private matches or mods or whatever it was. And uh, he realized, like, wow, why am I just, like, going to go and do a brand deal with this uh, random Minecraft server company? Uh, Why don't I just build my own Minecraft server company? And, you know, like, that is... That, it, it's pretty amazing because he was he, probably in his late teens when he yeah, did this, yeah. right? He yeah. was he was probably you know eighteen, nineteen at that time, and uh, he found someone to run that business, and and uh, he got to do sort of the holy grail of of what I think you know every creator wants to do, which is you build something that's very endemic to your own audience, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, so when he started to promote it and he was like, hey, this is my Minecraft server, uh, it really took off. And it's still one of the top uh, Minecraft server companies, like even today, you know, five years later or however long it's been. And uh, I mean, I can say confidently that business is 
very lucrative, but it also is really special because it's just uh, like a good twist or like a it's an authentic way for him to monetize uh, and, and, you know, just like move into this world. And then I would say the other example, uh, and, and I was I was more involved in this one uh, was with Mr. Beast, who, uh, you know, he's he's a major, major creator getting 20, 30 million views per video. And uh, there was sort of this this opportunity where I was talking with him maybe a year or two ago, and, and we were sitting brainstorming uh, like software ideas that, that uh, he could build for, for himself or games that he could build for himself. And uh, we we toyed around with this idea of uh, called Finger on the App, and, and mm-hmm. we worked with uh, this, this company called Mischief, which was... Uh, Sort of like you know that that company is worthy of a podcast episode <laughs> alone as well. Uh, but they they do like internet drops and and make very fun projects and then sort of move on to the next thing. But they thought it would be a really interesting opportunity to partner with with Mr. Beast on uh, this thing called Finger on the App, where uh, you, basically the the quick game or the game mechanic was uh, you leave your finger on on this app uh, and and the last person to leave their finger on the app. Uh, won some amount of money. I forget the exact amount, but I think it was like fifty thousand dollars. And it was a tie, uh, right? <laughs> yeah, and it ended up it ended up being a tie. Uh, yeah, I, and my, because, my son loved that one. Yeah, because like Mr. Beast was like, I'm not gonna have these people sit here for. I think it lasted like forty six hours or something like that. It's yeah. Pretty in, insane. And uh, it's worth noting, like there was actual game mechanics in that uh, you had to move your finger to certain spots, uh, so that way, like you couldn't just you know, keep your, like, uh, I don't know, keep a fake finger on there. That's right. And yeah. it's a good example of, like, how, again, when when the creator is building something that is authentic to their brand or who people recognize them for, uh, how successful something can be because that immediately became the number one app on in, in on the <laughs> App Store. Uh, and, and it also then took over, you know, every social media platform that you can think of. Like, uh, there was, there's actual, you know, people that made TikTok accounts of them showing it. And those people ended up with a million followers of them pro- like, tracking their progress doing it. And, uh, like, it, it was a very just clear like example of when you do something that is on brand uh you can really take these things to another level and and when you can get your community involved in it uh it's sort of like a multiplier and so for me like those those two examples are just like the holy grail examples yeah. of what happens when you when you're building something right for your audience i mean so I hope everyone who's listening can wrap their heads around the implications of this. Once upon a time, this dude, these guys would record themselves playing Minecraft generally and talking shit with their friends while they did so. And people loved that. So then they did it more and more and more. And they they grew their network, generally speaking, inside of YouTube to significant numbers And their fan base, their community got so, so engaged, so deeply engaged with the brand of the creator that they could then look at creating completely new experiences. So no longer are they beholden to Minecraft, although with a Minecraft server in some way they are, but the finger on the app or the Mr. Beast Burger or whatever, those are completely new, bespoke, standalone experiences or uh, you know, drops or whatever you want to call them um, mm-hmm. that are then in starting from, you know, they're not starting from zero. They're starting from 10 million or like whatever, you know, whatever number the the, the follower, in, uh, the, the creator in, in question has in terms of followers. So there's this huge sort of instant player base or this huge engaged user base for these content ex- experiences that these creators are making. It is, you know, a completely new paradigm. And so I guess, is that the creator economy? Like, like because it's not just YouTube, you know, like like ad revenue anymore, right? It's so much more than that. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think the creator economy in, in my mind is sort of just like the power to the individual in, in okay. general. For most of these stories, it started with you know just one person with a camera and uh, and going online and 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 posting their videos and and it somehow you know caught on. And I think uh, the creator economy overall, or you know you can call it the passion economy, is the other side of this. Like I, I always 
you know, I think of YouTube and social media and these these platforms as really interesting because if you ask any kid, uh, I'd say 99% of them would say they'd love to be a YouTuber or a TikTok star or something like that when they grow up. And I think that's really confusing to a lot of parents or, you know, the older generations because they're just like, what? Like, what does that even mean? Like, you're, It's you're, almost like, as weird <laughs> as saying you want to be a professional gamer. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> it, 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 but the thing that is, you know, like the real truth of like everyone wants to be a YouTuber or everyone wants to be a TikTok star because what that means is you're getting paid to do whatever you want. You're just mm-hmm. recording yourself mm-hmm. and uh, or like you're getting paid to do what you love. And that that's really what you know youtube and the creator world is is uh it's just enabling you to make money or uh like basically just build a community around doing what you actually really love to do and that doesn't have to you know be the high end big big creators like you could be a random person in like Minnesota who knits all day and uh, they just Absolutely. post great knitting videos and those knitting videos do really well with the knitting community totally. and they might be able to open up their own knitting store one day or maybe they open up their own knitting e-commerce site. Like there's so many different ways that this goes, but the piece for me that I always go back to is like this is all around is more and more value accruing to the specific individuals. I think and, that's a, a great point. Uh, and, and and there's this point where like there's a, there's now this shift where if you're a creator, uh, you get to ask a question which like no other entrepreneur gets to ask, which is like, I have blank number of followers or I have you know X number of of people to watch my videos. What can I build for them? Like that's a totally different uh, question than like an entrepreneur who's starting out today and they're going like. I need to figure out the problem and then yeah, like what solve problem for I it. Trying to solve? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And w- which is, you know, w- my view of where the creator economy goes is like anything that is pure commodity, like whether it's umbrellas or, you know, like uh, surfboards, whatever it might be, just like pure commodity stuff. Uh, you will see creators just build brands within those spaces and yep. those will become the, the dominant brands within them. I love the, I actually really like the word passion economy. I, I love that phrase. And it, it reminds me of a, A quick story, Um, maybe you can share one, a similar one. So I have a very good friend who lives in the States. His name is uh, Darian Ford. And uh, last year before COVID or sort of in the downturn, let's say of COVID, he went hiking um, and he went hiking in the Adirondacks and he was walking through the Adirondacks and uh, he came across this guy who was totally kitted out, right? This guy had a backpack filled with tech. He had drones and tripods and cameras and all sorts of stuff like this. And uh, they get to chatting and, and the guy's, you know, recording himself and, and, and recording my friend Darian and, and, you know, check to make sure it was okay that he was in this video. And, and so Darian was like, yeah, absolutely no problem. So what's, what's this all about? And the guy's like, oh, well, this is my job. I, um, I go on treks. And I record videos of my treks and I post them to YouTube. And Darian shared this with me and I sort of like chuckled, like, oh, isn't that cute? Like this guy, you know, has this little side hustle and he takes videos of himself walking in the woods. Isn't that cute? Well, you know, so adorable. This guy had 250,000 followers on YouTube. <laughs> 250,000. His full-time job was going on the most gorgeous, amazing walks you can imagine, recording it, editing videos and publishing them. I yep. mean, if there's not a better example of the passion economy, I don't know what is, because well, I would love to do that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I have uh, uh, some good friends that they run a YouTube channel called Yes Theory, which is... Oh, I love that uh, channel. They, I mean, it's these three friends that, you know, they've sort of push themselves to seek discomfort is is yeah. their their overall phrase but their day-to-day life i mean it it, it is the dream right like they're yeah. going and, and jumping on planes to go to i don't know they'll go to a random country and and like the the thing that you know i would never be able to do it because it would be so far outside of my comfort zone but they'll like leave their phones and their wallets and and just like <laughs> uh try and find a way to like crash on someone's couch or something you yeah. know and and, and they like they are getting paid to go and do this really interesting and fun stuff. And, and I, I, I totally get it. You know, like this, this person uh, that you're referencing who has, you know, 250,000 followers who's recording their tracks. Like I, I get it. Like people want to watch that and, and it might sound crazy that people want to watch that. And in the same way that I think people look at, 
Twitch and they're like, oh my gosh, you're insane for watching someone, you know, play video games. Like, why wouldn't yeah. you just go play video yeah. games? But uh, it really comes down to like, these people are entertainers, but they're a different type of entertainer than, yes. than we're ever used to. Yes. Uh, yes. And they they understand their audience and there's a reason why people are coming back. And yes. uh, yeah, I, I, I just think we're in this really really interesting shift though like uh, and, and and the connection that people feel and maybe this is the other piece that, that we, we should touch on is like the the really unique piece of being a creator is that uh everyone is along for your journey uh and and that like most people leave up their first videos and you can go back and watch you know mr beast's first videos mr beast still has every video he's basically ever posted on his, his youtube channel and you can actually see he posted i think it's like 250 or 300 videos before one of them ever even hit right uh and 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 you can just go back and see the grind of like oh my gosh he, he was really trying to to make it yeah. and and that, and that think, video that hit wasn't him giving a hundred thousand dollars away, which you know is is a pretty common. <laughs> Everyone yeah. just assumed that <laughs> exactly. he just he magically had millions of dollars from day one to start throwing away. Yeah, no, I mean it's actually crazy. His 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 first video that hit was, uh, and and if you ever talk with him, he'll talk about how like he he knew he needed to do YouTube, and it was what his dream was. That he actually. I think it was like he counted to a hundred thousand on on video, uh, and sort of just went to this extreme, extreme level of like, there's no way this is real. And it, he uploaded like a forty hour video of him just sitting there counting <laughs> to a hundred thousand. And so uh, it, it's just a perfect example of like that's very on brand for him, and later became his brand of like, let's just do really outrageous things. Yeah, man. but I think when when you're a, like. Uh, as a fan or a viewer when you get to see the journey then you are that much more invested in their career or like you're rooting for them to win uh and you see it a lot with like mr beast or there's a big creator like emma chamberlain or david dobrik like they have real real fans that have more fandom you know for them than you know the traditional celebrities that we're used to i mean you you have just laid the seed for, I don't know, five more of my questions. And I want to <laughs> deep dive into all of those. But but I, I will just share another little tidbit or story about this idea of their fans or their followers genuinely wanting them to succeed. You know, so again, going back to my my kids, I've got three three young kids, uh, 13, 11, and, and six. My, my middle son is 11. And he holds Mr. Beast up as his example of what he aspires to be as a person, not in that he just wants to be a YouTuber, although, you know, he he does want to be a YouTuber, but he feels like he knows Mr. Beast. Yes. And that Mr. Beast is his friend and that Mr. Beast is uh, an example of how good a person can be in the world. And so he sets Mr. Beast up as his aspirational model for the kind of person he wants to be 100% 100% based off of watching the YouTube videos. Yes. And, and and by the way, you know, there's there's tons of pros and cons to all that, but it is, uh, I think the, the piece there is, and it makes sense, right? Like I I, I'm, I was the same way uh, and, and we could talk about, you know, 100 Thieves and, and uh, that whole world. But uh, I was I was a big fan of of this YouTube creator named Nate Shot. And he, sure, Nate Shot, yeah. uh, he was, you know, one of the biggest uh, YouTube gamer or like he was the biggest gamer, one of the biggest gamers at the time when I was growing up. He was very similar age to me uh he was in my mind he was living the dream right like Mm -hmm. while i was in high school he was going out and playing call of duty tournaments he was going and you know he's one of the first players to ever be sponsored by red bull you know he was just like crushing and i i remember like i always looked up to him or i always saw like he was just this brilliant person uh and it's weird because like I in, in later on in life when I ended up in venture, uh, I ended up uh, investing in him and getting to know him really well. And like he's probably one of my closest friends to like today, you know, and mm, uh, which is which is very weird in that like uh, I felt like I knew him before he ever even knew I existed. If if that makes sense, absolutely. Um, but like I still, it was still like authentic enough that it was actually him, and that yep. like I, 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 which is you know a strong testament to him as well. Okay, so I think I know the answer to this question. So you talked about authenticity or authentic, and yet 
And, and we've talked about a variety of different platforms already uh, with YouTube, Twitch, and probably TikTok being the three that kind of yep. stand out the most uh, from our conversation so far. And, and, and maybe they even stand out today, at least in North America, as kind of like amongst the three biggest kind of creator platforms. Yep. Um, but like, what does it take, other than, you know, a little bit of luck, what does it take to be a great content creator on these different platforms? Like, what do they have in common? And and what are some of the standout differences? Or are there? Like, because, I don't know, it seems to me like great Twitch streamers do not necessarily equate great YouTube yep. content creators. Yeah, I, I, I think it's overall, you know, despite the platform differences, I think the creators amongst all three of these platforms or just any social platform, the key has to be like, one, that you're authentic. I think the internet you know, has become really good uh, at, at sort of sniffing out what is real or not. Okay. <laughs> and and, and in, in the context of like, I don't know, let's say I was promoting, you know, the next Angry Birds. If I wasn't actually a fan of Angry Birds, like, and I had never talked about gaming ever before, like my audience will understand that and sort of just ignore that, you know? That's right. Uh, yeah. and, 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 uh, and so being just, yourself and working with brands of yourself like that's for sure one piece but i think the other piece is like you have to genuinely love it and that's the thing that uh i think a lot of creators you know over the next decade that will happen is and, and sort of makes me nervous in that like a lot of kids do want to be youtubers or content creators but uh they need to like really love making videos and doing this world because if you don't and and i mean you could say that across pretty much every job but this is a job and uh burnout is real and the hours are insane and it, it's like it's not just a pure set and forget thing like there is a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes and you're you're doing a lot of studying in my opinion like i think if you ask mr beast what his day-to-day -day looks like he he's he studied YouTube and what YouTube videos do well. Uh, and like, you know, he, he has a very good read on sort of the algorithms themselves, right? Like if you just talk about, let's say YouTube as an example, like he would say on YouTube, the, the, the two things that matter the most, and, and he's been very public about this is like average view duration. So like uh, how long on average someone is watching your videos and then click through rate of like your thumbnail. And, mm -hmm. and like, if both of those are high, uh, then, then like your video will do well. And, you know, that sounds really simple, but like, there's definitely ways to, to think about it and how to make your videos sort of fit in that algorithm. And I think if you watch Mr. Beast video with those two things in mind, like it will become very clear that he's, he's just very good at storytelling. And That's right. Yeah. He's storytelling to the, to the algorithm in some way, right? Mm -hmm. Like he's, he's designed the storytelling, uh, specifically to like the, the algorithm constraints of like, Hey, uh, you, if this is like a dry point of the video and we're seeing people drop off, like in the next video, I should make sure we just don't have anything like that. And, That's right. and it's so refined that he's just very methodical. And I think a lot of YouTube creators are very methodical because it is just a really hard platform to, to thrive on. But if you do break through, then, you know, the momentum carries it forward. And yet like Twitch is, it's very different. I mean, Twitch is yeah. much less about being a sort of storyteller yep. in the typical sense, right? Yep. I, I, I would say, you know, Twitch is, in my mind, is is as much about consistency like as anything else. And that like having a consistent schedule of, hey, I'm streaming on Tuesday from, you know, 3 p.m. to 10 p.m. And like, uh, I'm going to do that every day this week. Like, I think those pieces are really critical. But it also takes an entirely different skill set uh, in my mind to be just like always on on camera oh and God. being and willing while to... while you're playing with like yes. all those distractions. I mean, I yes. just can't even imagine it. When yeah. I game, I'm the most boring person in the world. I mean, like, forget talking to me about anything. I'm just, shh, shh, don't talk to me. Shh, <laughs> focus. Right. Yep. Forget about me trying to entertain an audience. There's no chance. Yeah, and, 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 <clears> they're, <throat> and they're real entertainers in that they're able to read chat. They're able to read their donations. And, you know, some of the best streamers like uh, Nick Merckx or, or someone like that, 
they're they actually remember people in their chat you know like they'll they'll be like hey blake welcome back like how have you been you know and then you're like whoa oh my gosh this is like uh amazing and and i think twitch is is its whole like world because you know there's there's a lot of like uh nuances and dynamics within it where like some pieces are gamified with badges for specific creators and and being able to like show pride that you're part of it but i think that you are really bought into that world and you you have an incredible loyalty to the streamer that you watch because in some ways it feels you know what what your son was talking about with mr beast i think people feel that even more uh when it comes to to uh like streamers if you watch a streamer every day for you know four or five hours you really actually do probably know that person like objectively <laughs> like you know right. like you, you 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 are spending probably more time with them uh than their own family is spending time with them you know or yeah. like their their cousin spending time yeah. with them uh and you understand you know the funny things that happen in their day what the bad things that happen in their day and uh and so you're just sort of there for it and I, and i think twitch in a lot of ways is sort of leaning into this like i, I think the creators on there or the streamers on there really lean into like this is my community and like please to support me and and as a person uh and i mean it's been amazing to watch and and just going back to the piece before where it was like why would someone even watch someone play games like the example that i always you know uh like see or like there's like a, a famous comic that i've seen of the, the dad going to their son being like why are you watching games like you can just go play games and then uh the kid coming back into the room and talking to him when when the dad's watching football and is like why are you watching you know <laughs> uh, football when you can go play football and uh, and I think, you know, that that perfectly summarizes in the like, That's you just want to watch the best and you want to yep. watch the entertainers. And it, it's it's a totally different dynamic than playing the game itself. Yep. No, I, I, I agree. I do think there's some generational stuff in there. And, and maybe we can get into that a little bit later on, because, I mean, you know, again, I, well, I'm 42 uh, you know, I've been gaming my entire life. I've been working professionally in games for 22 years now. Uh, wow. You know, it's hard to have games be a bigger part of someone's life than they are of mine. I think, like, it's the, the yeah. everyone who knows me knows that I'm, you know, I'm 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 big into games and gaming and the industry and all of that sort of stuff. And and yet, I find Twitch streams difficult. Like I, 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 you know, and I've, I've watched all the best, right? And I've like, okay, this time I'm going to really get into it. And I just sit there and after a while, I'm like, there's millions of people and the chat's going so fast. I can't even read what they're saying. And, you know, the streamer is playing a game and he's so good at it that I can hardly follow the action of what's going on on screen. And so eventually I'm like, eh, you know what? Like, it's not for me. And I bounce and I go to YouTube where I find that, the sort of narrative and the pacing of it usually is structured in a way that I find, you know, a little bit more kind of familiar or, or yep. just accessible maybe from my old man eyes. Um, but do you, do you see any of that? Do you think there is a sort of generational breakdown between like Twitch and YouTube and like what demographics or ages maybe are more drawn to one versus the other? Yeah, I think it's, look, if you are, if you aren't like used to Twitch and you're not, I, I think Twitch in my mind has a little bit of like a higher barrier and mm -hmm. that uh, you, if you just turn on a stream for, for Twitch, like you're not going to understand it. You yeah, know, exactly. it, it, it's, it's gonna, you need the context of sort of coming back for, for a couple of days and the same way, like, you know, if you just picked up a random game, uh, you sometimes need to to play it for you know a week or two before like you can really give really a, a true yeah. uh, thought thoughts on it. And I think that's what I would say for Twitch is like you sort of have to build loyalty to like one or two streamers and and just watch for a week or two okay. and watch for like a good amount of time because you know like once you're once you're in it you're like whoa okay like now I really want to support them and so uh, I think it's more just like the generational differences there is more that like you probably just don't have time to sit Maybe and watch that. a streamer yeah. for for two three hours Maybe it's you know time investment. Uh, and, and 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 I think that's a big piece of it is like if you're not going to be able to watch them for two three hours then uh, it it sort of defeats the purpose in my okay. mind like and and uh, I think you know YouTube is. Uh, probably easier to to understand because the videos are just such short bursts uh, and like you know most videos are 10 minutes at most and so it's just easier and like the storytelling again is a big piece of it of like okay we need to compress it down into 10 minutes whereas right. i think twitch is 
pure authenticity and just like raw you know yeah. you're just like okay <laughs> uh like well, let's just see what happens yeah. and uh very like if you were there then then you know type of thing and i imagine tons of kids uh go into schools the next day and they're talking about like oh my gosh did you see like you know nick Merck's stream yesterday when that flight broke out or something <laughs> it's, uh, it's or the like, new water cooler moment nobody yeah. talks about tea remember when we used to talk about like <laughs> lost or like television yep, yep. shows or movies yeah yep. no it's tw- it's not even the games it's the streamers playing the games yes exactly. that is the water cooler conversation in the schoolyard yes and, and and by the way you know like as a quick tangent like within the uh minecraft world there's there's a big youtuber named uh dream which yeah. i don't know if your, your son is uh, absolutely uh, he, okay. he he's 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 team dream okay amazing and, and yeah. so like dream dream and his friends uh have created this private server, which they basically, you know, they, they treat it as if it's like a modern cartoon, you know, yep, like, and it, they're they, like they, playing they, out the it, whole story. Yeah. And, and it, it is remarkable to watch. Uh, and you are for sure talking about the dream server, you know, the next time you're talking to your friends, because it really is a cartoon and they're playing out, you know, this entire story. And it's just, I mean, it's incredible to watch. And, if you aren't familiar with Dream, you should just go to Dream's YouTube channel and you can see, you know, it, it has like every video he's ever uploaded has like 20, 30 million views. And no, it's insane. I mean, his manhunt video, his man videos are genuinely compelling watching. Yes. Like, I don't care if you don't get video games at all. Yep. Dreams manhunt videos are as tense as and and exciting as almost you know any TV show I've ever watched. <laughs> yeah, look, I, I don't I don't really play Minecraft much, but I still can appreciate just how amazing oh, no. he is at storytelling oh, and yeah. making these videos. Yeah, and no, it's great. It, it, I mean, and and he's also one of the fastest growing creators like of all time. Like he, yeah. he went from zero to ten million subscribers last year. Yeah, uh, and his rise is like he's showing no signs of slowing down. So. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's it's amazing to watch. That's very cool. Well, I, I do want to talk a lot more about um, sort of the, the individuals, the personalities, the, the the creators. But and Dream is a great one. I I, I find him fascinating. But um, I want to maybe close the loop a little bit on economics first. Um, yep. We we went on all these really awesome, exciting tangents, but we did kind of start on this thread talking about economics. So g- help us. Like, obviously, when you reach the kind of dream and Mr. Beast level or whatever, or the Preston level, like the economics and the opportunities are totally different, right? So so let's put those guys aside and let's let's take, you know, whatever, like a medium-sized creator. I don't know what that is. I assume it's like 100 to 250K, something like that. Maybe that qualifies as medium-sized these days. But whatever medium size is, let's take that as an example. Can you help uh, kind of like like enumerate the various revenue streams available to content creators around that size. And and the reason why I ask is the following. Like, I have heard some variant of, you know, why would kids donate real money to a Twitch streamer? What's in it for them? <laughs> yeah. So many times in my life, I've completely lost track. Like, I don't even know. Like, I hear that all the bloody time, right? Yep. I assume you've heard it even more than I have. Yep. And so I'm wondering if you can kind of help people understand a little bit the different ways that these creators make money and and kind of why they make money. And I think most people probably get YouTube and ads, yep. um, but I know that not everything is quite so cut and dry. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, so... You know, the, the the first way that they're making money is is really around, you know, the YouTube AdSense and, uh, you know, TikTok has their own creator fund. Snapchat has their own creator fund now. And there's all these built in standard like CPM type revenue streams where you get paid X amount of dollars for, you know, based off of uh, however many thousands of views you get on your videos. That is, you know, if you're starting out, I would say that's a good chunk of your your revenue just because you know, you're making it directly off of views. And uh, that's, you know, that, that's the standard way. You start to graduate into brand deals. And uh, I'd say brand deals sort of break off into two pieces. Like one is, uh, hey, just promote this this game or product uh, and you'll get a set amount of money. And then there's the other piece, which is, you know, affiliate revenue, uh, where you see a lot of these creators at the midsize. And this is really common at the midsize where, you get paid affiliate 
revenue based off of every transaction that someone you know does using your code like i don't know let's say you're promoting some skincare company and and the skincare company is like use code blake at checkout and you'll get five dollars off if you've ever seen that or twenty dollars off uh that is typically a deal where uh the creator has some deal with that company saying hey i get a kickback of you know, ten dollars of that twenty dollars to me uh, for for helping to facilitate or get credit for that transaction, and those are the really high level ones of of just like how you would monetize on on YouTube in general or uh, maybe some of the others. Like if you go into Twitch, you know what we're talking about for donations and tips and uh, that world. There's that is the primary revenue stream of of a Twitch streamer is donations and tips and then there's another piece called monthly subscriptions which a lot of people who aren't deep in in twitch world uh really don't even know this exists but uh it's where you you actually pay to subscribe to someone on on twitch which subscribe is different like the the wording here is different than what we're used to uh subscribing means on, on on youtube subscribe here means uh you get access to a certain number of badges uh and and emotes in in chat and things like that and and it typically costs like five dollars a month uh, to subscribe to someone and and you know they, they gamified it where if you subscribe for a year, you know, you show up different in chat or if you, you subscribe for two years, you get a different uh, uh, like nameplate in chat than someone else. And so mm-hmm. those pieces uh, you know, actually monetize incredibly well. The reason why someone you know would donate and which, you know, again, it sounds subscribe, crazy. Yeah. yeah. Or subscribe. It, it like it sounds crazy to say it that like, why would you just give these people more money you know like let's think about ninja who's probably the biggest uh streamer that that you know people listening to this will know he you know is is probably has i don't even know how tens of millions or however many millions at, at this point of, of dollars like why would someone ever donate to that person you know like and and, and i think it's really more of the wording of donations is is like the like yeah a, exactly oh, it sounds weird like you're not actually really donating you're you're giving them money um but the I view it as it's leaning into like get acknowledged or like get your question answered. Like there's there's a lot of different pieces to it, but like you'll see people send Ninja money and be like, "Hey, it's my son's birthday today. Do you mind like shouting him out on stream?" And like for sure, you know, like that that's a actually a really simple way to do it. And I imagine for the three dollars that you spent to get that message read, uh, it probably means way more to that kid than than you know whatever the hundred dollar gift you got is. Right. Uh, and so. I think of donations in my mind or the subscription piece because the streamers typically acknowledge when someone subscribes as well as almost like a digital signature or like, you know, okay. the, or like an autograph in the way that, you know, we used to go up to celebrities and be like, hey, will you sign this? Uh, or like, hey, can we take a selfie? Like this is the, you know, even more like the future version of it where they're just you you're able to take a clip of this and timestamp it and record it if you want to of like hey i asked them a question and that's and they, true and they, <laughs> it's not purely ephemeral because you can record it yes um oh god what's that app where you can like get celebrities to like oh yeah cameo yeah cameo. Yeah, it's okay. yeah it's it's kind of like it's it's almost like like cameo for gamers or something yes like yeah that. yeah no it, it it's very cameo esque and and uh i think it lends itself even more so than maybe a cameo because you're uh you're building that relationship and you're watching for hours a day right. and so uh you know sometimes people will, and 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 by the way like there is some status of like getting your message read or you sparking the conversation by asking some question sure. or you know you see sometimes like you'll see people donate like really big amounts of money and if you go on on Twitch you can, or on on YouTube you can find, I'm sure, tons of uh, compilations of, of videos of people donating really large sums of money to these creators to get a reaction. Because, like, one, like, you know, if someone just gave me ten thousand dollars on a Twitch stream, like, you better like bet that my my reaction would be insane. Uh, and then, like, they also, you know, that person in in the chat who donated it is sort of like a celebrity now, and and within the that like community. Because, like, again, if you were there. Then you're like you were there for that moment of you know when Blake donated ten thousand dollars to Ninja. Uh, that's like a very very cool moment, uh, sure. and it, you know you, you feel cool within the status of that world. 
Assuming you have the $10,000. Yeah, assuming, you, assuming yeah. you have the $10,000. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's like, so I wrote here, and I'm wondering if this sits well with you, like Gen X, so, you know, people around my age, we had celebrities like Entertainment Tonight and, you know, whatever, like, uh, uh, you know, just celebrity fascination. We wanted to follow up on the various celebrities and their comings and their goings and keeping up with the Kardashians and all of that sort of stuff. And then, and then millennials, it kind of feels like influencers were the thing. Uh, and so they didn't maybe, I mean, this is sweeping generalizations, but kind of broad strokes that felt like influencers became the new celebrities. And now it feels like, like Gen Z, it's the creators, right? Yep. Like, and so is, are, are Gen Z creators the celeb, are, are, are creators the celebrities for Gen Z? Yeah, I mean, yeah. look, the the creators that are big right now are have far more influence than the traditional celebrities that you know we would think of, of like a Tom Cruise or you know some I don't know just someone like that. The reason for that is is because they've just broken down the walled garden, and uh, you know you traditionally think of the like Kardashians or Kanye or these people, and you're really only seeing them through the lens of like the paparazzi view, you know, uh, or, you know, you're seeing them when they do very public stuff or when they're, they're finally, you know, maybe the Kardashians are different because they're actually recording their day-to-day -day life sometimes, uh, for their show. But in general, like YouTube and just these new type of creators are just way more raw and authentic. And so you're just building a much bigger relationship with them. Uh, and, and, and it doesn't have to be, you know, like even, for gen z like for us like or like for gen z like i think for me like there's people that i have that view with of like i would respect like david dobrik more than or like i, I want to meet david dobrik more than i want to meet i don't know any major celebrity that you can think of and uh that's just because i've watched all of his videos and, and sort of watched his rise as a creator hmm. that's really really cool all right then let's We've talked about Mr. Beast so many times. We've mentioned his name so many times. But yep. again, with the assumption that most people who are listening to this have heard of him, but maybe can't quite wrap their head around the phenomenon, can can you set up the Mr. Beast phenomenon? Because I, I feel like it it will really sort of put a bow on everything we talked about up until now about sort of, you know, the economics, the opportunities, the, 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 the creator as a business model, and this idea of authentic creators as modern day celebrities. Because, man, if, if people out there don't know the kinds of stuff that Mr. Beast is capable of as, as, a, as a, I don't even know what to call it, a phenomenon, <laughs> yep. uh, I think it really is telling. Can you, can you help people understand the phenomenon? Yeah, I, I mean, look, Mr. Beast is 22, I believe, right now. And he started posting videos on YouTube when he was probably 16 or something like that. Okay. And today he has 54, 55 million subscribers on, on, his, on his main channel. He's one of the fastest growing creators of all time. Uh, and I think, you know, I'm, I'm pretty confident and I can say with like almost certainty that he will surpass, you know, PewDiePie and... Um, and, and be one of the biggest or be the biggest individual creator channel of all time. Uh, he is just his content, you know, alone is, is what I would describe as like anti clickbait. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're, if you're familiar with just the term clickbait of saying like, Hey, there's something happening. And then you click into it and you're like, what the heck? This isn't what I clicked into. Yeah. Uh, that is the opposite of what Mr. Beast does. Like Mr. Beast, his videos are like, I last person to, you know, remove your hand, get to Lamborghini. And like, you're like, you click into that and you're like, there's no way that that's real. And then it actually happens. And you're like, what the heck? Like, he actually just gave someone randomly like uh, a Lamborghini. And and so he is just, uh, and, he, and he's leveling it up. I, I would say he's the first creator that I have ever met that is reinvesting his money that he is making from YouTube uh, or just from content creation in general directly into his videos. So, mm -hmm. you know, he's spending... Probably today, you know, anywhere between a hundred thousand to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars per video, and and that is, you know, most <laughs> creators obviously can't do that. But he started off by just 
uh, making money on on with YouTube AdSense and getting his first brand deals, and then he started rolling all that money back into his channel uh, to optimize for growth, which you know makes sense to us from like a business perspective because we are you know we're just viewing it more as like a business. But he's the first creator that I've ever met or ever heard that is actually taking the money that they're making and investing it directly into the content or the business itself. And he's just reinvesting uh, for growth and it, and it's just continued to work. And so, you know, he's getting, you know, probably close to 100,000 new subscribers every single day. Uh, he also, you know, he had a finger on the app. Uh, he launched his own burger business, uh, a nationwide burger business here in, in uh, that broke North America. The internet. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, it's called Mr. Beast burger and it sort of just blew up overnight when that happened. Uh, I mean, it, it, he's got his hands in so many different pieces, uh, and it's just been amazing, amazing to watch. I think, uh, it is one where if you looked into it, you would just be like, what is happening? How is this real? And, he just really understands. He actually created this format. Uh, I think Logan Paul called it. it it's called uh, like the Jenga format, where uh, you know uh, the ending of of like a Jenga uh, match. You know, <laughs> or oh like yeah, a, yeah, yeah. But uh, how how you get there is, is yes, is exactly. All very fun. And, and so like the stakes uh, increase over time, and as the videos c- continue, because mm-hmm. you're like getting closer and closer to like the Jenga falling but you still want to watch until the end. And and so, you know, traditionally when you watch a, I don't know, a, a movie or something like that, the climax might actually happen like in the middle or towards the beginning. Sure, Whereas sure. on YouTube and specifically for Mr. Beast, he's designed his videos. So like the climax happens at the end <laughs> uh, yeah. because that's like when you should exit out. And so I, he's just pioneered this world in a, a completely different way than we've seen anyone else uh, approach the space. Yeah, and I mean, Mr. Beast Burger, like, not to just, whatever, hammer that one until it's dead, but I just want to make sure everyone understands this fully. So something like 3,000, last count, 3,000 restaurants through, you know, United States that were otherwise, let's face it, probably struggling, right? Yep. COVID probably shut their doors. They were they were probably seen significantly reduced, if not completely eliminated, business or, or yep. heavily reduced to, to, to orders. Now suddenly there's at least 3,000 restaurants through the United States that are churning out um, Mr. Beast Burger, right? Basically yep. this, this, this one burger to be delivered in their you know, micro footprint, their specific business, their, uh, their specific area. And in certain cases, having to rehire staff, right? Or, or grow significantly larger than they had been pre-pandemic to keep up with the demand that this once upon a time Minecraft player is now driving towards their brick and mortar business. Like yes. if you if you don't think we live in the future when you <laughs> hear that, I don't I don't know what rock you are under, but that thing is like I I have a hard time coming up with a story that's a better picture of kind of like the new world order than that one. That one just really floors me. Yeah, and, and and it goes back to you know everything we we've, we've been talking about. Where like if you if you have this audience that's really engaged and wants to support you, like what can you build that is uh, authentic and to your audience? And you know I, he made and, and by the way, like it, it's pretty, it's even more amazing because you think about how little Mr. Beast has actually promoted this uh, in the grand scheme of things. Like he made one video and then he's made, you know, social posts about it, but he's only Mm -hmm. made one video on his main channel uh, about this and it is completely blown up and it's still a sustainable business right now, which is just amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Really, really, really cool. Um, Okay. So back to games in particular, I think it's safe to say that in 2020, to the top game phenomena, so I, I, Among Us and Fall Guys, at least for me, they really popped because of very specific moments with streamers. Uh, I wasn't on the stream, I didn't, I didn't watch the stream, but you know, research would seem to suggest that in July of 2020, some streamer named looks like Soda Poppin, you know, kind of like whatever discovered, you know, Among Us, even though it had been out for a while, and kind of like promoted it, and 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 that led to this sort of real spike for Among Us. Um, and, and Among Us is, you know, is still 
super hot, maybe slightly less than it was a few months ago. I would say hotter than Fall Guys, but but still super hot. So yep. do you see this trend continuing of like like streamers making games? Like like are all the top games of the next few years going to be sort of made by streamers? Ooh. Not made, not created by yeah, them, yeah, yeah. but like, is their success yep. going to be driven by streamers? Yeah, it's a it's a really good question, and I think it's you know even even before Among Us and, and Fall Guys, there was uh, Apex Legends, which tried to do sort of the extreme example of this, where uh, and, and and you know Fortnite, you know the year before or whatever, two years before, a lot of that was uh, driven. But or like you know, they're they're sort of like fuel on the fire for with with Twitch and YouTube. But I think you know, Apex Legends is is an interesting example because they they took the paid acquisition approach where yeah. they sort of spent you know a, a lot of money to have everyone play on, and, and it's sort of this interesting case study of like, wow, okay, like can you can you can make a game by paying every big streamer to play for you know a week straight or something, uh, and it definitely worked you know i don't know if it worked like as a sustainable thing but it definitely made apex legends the thing that everyone was talking about got me to download apex legends and uh and 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 that world is you know i think that piece is really interesting i think among us and fall guys they're interesting examples where like they for sure you know these streamers pushed them forward uh and i think that will continue to but it might actually just hint more towards like where these PC games are heading and that like uh, both those games are, are like party games or, mm-hmm. you know, we, we saw brief uh, moments where where like Rust came back and, yeah, and had yeah, a huge a moment whole... as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and I think like these games do really well on stream because they're essentially like party games or they're just very, very, there's like built in loops for the entertainment value uh like you know you could still look at gta 5 and gta 5 still you know is absolutely crushing as as a game um and 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 mainly because of the streamer aspect of it in the youtube side where uh people are doing the role play servers or uh the built-in sort of entertainment value i think among us and fall guys to go back to even just the Jenga, you know, storytelling that we were talking about with with Mr. Beast, like both of those have very clear, like you know, feedback loops of mm-hmm. like, okay, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna win this or I'm not gonna win this, and they're very quick bursts. But the dynamics of everyone, you know, sort of fighting or or the streamers all being in one room or whatever it is, like that piece just makes it way more entertaining. Like I actually, I've only played probably an hour or two of Among Us in, in total, but I've gone really deep and 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 watched you know thousands or not thousands but i've definitely watched like dozens of hours of 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 among us on on twitch and youtube and it's it's a weird thing where the games itself might actually just be designed for pure entertainment value you know Uh, and then like and then when you're playing with your friends like you could make a case that maybe like mario party should come back you know or or those type of games uh and 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 i think uh and it might just be at 2020, like these things are exaggerated because of COVID and, and uh, the environment that we were in. But I do think there's a piece where like gaming, uh, if you can make it more accessible uh, and then you can tie it into just like, I don't know, friends playing with each other, mm-hmm. it just naturally like becomes more interesting. So the party thing makes a lot of sense. Like just speaking from my own point of view, you know, I find... Like the reactions in Among Us, you know, oh my God, no, you did not. And <laughs> I'm going to get you back. And like, oh, you traitor. You know, the the sort of yep. genuine shock and delight uh, that you see the streamers or, or the content creators um, experience when they're playing. Uh, I find that genuinely engaging and, and maybe a little bit more accessible than, you know, if you're watching like a hardcore shooter and it's like, you know, left flank, left flank. Who's got to drop? Who's got to drop? No, no, don't camp, don't camp. You know, and it's kind of like, okay, like, I, I guess maybe like, I mean, that's the eSport. Like, you've got to be yep. into the sport to be into the sport yes. vernacular, right? It's not kind of like the base co- human condition. It's more like if yep. you don't know the rules of football and you watch football, you might kind of be like, oh, my God, this is so boring. So you kind of got to know the details to understand, I think, and appreciate some of the, the eSport stuff. But the yep. party games just kind of feel more kind of, like global and, and more accessible. 
Yeah. Um, and I would say that fits for me from a from a streaming point of view. But I wonder if it's the same for YouTube. Like, I kind of feel like the games that really work on YouTube are not necessarily the same as what really works on streamable. Like, it not is it doesn't always it doesn't yep. always have to be just like about the party game on YouTube. There seems to yep. be some other stuff that YouTube content creators are looking for. Do you have any thought about that? I would say, like, I think that on YouTube, there's it's so much more about like intent, if that makes sense. Like you, if you want to go watch Fortnite videos because you watch Fortnite, you know, there's no shortage of Fortnite videos. <laughs> you know, like you can, you can go down that rabbit hole for, you know, years. And yep. and I think that is, whereas on, on Twitch, the reason why the influence of what these streamers play impacts like what you do uh, or like in, in the buying behavior is because you're much more loyal to the streamer in most cases than you are to the specific game. And okay. so okay, if, you, okay, if you're okay. a fan of, you know, I don't know, let, let's say Ninja or, or Valkyrie or someone like that, you're going to go and watch whatever Valkyrie is playing and, uh, and you're watching it because you're just a fan of that streamer. And, you know, there's, there's some push pull where like, you know, if, uh, Valkyrie isn't playing Among Us. Like her chat might be like, "Please go and play uh, Among Us." But uh, she ultimately like has control or like power in that like, she gets to choose what game she plays, and mm -hmm. so that naturally shifts a little bit of like where the attention is is being funneled. And so it's just different in that like YouTube, you're typically you're just jumping around in, in, in a lot of cases of just like, okay, I, I know that this YouTuber posts mainly Fortnite content. I'm just going to watch their Fortnite content, you know? Uh, and, and uh, the feedback loops on both sides, you know, like as a creator, you get pretty good feedback loops of uh, look, when I'm, when I post among us videos, they do really well. Or like when I don't post among us videos, they, they uh, all those other videos struggle like that for sure leans into it. And so they start to play those games too. But mm -hmm. I, I, I think, uh, the thing that, you know, and, and you see Minecraft continue to do insanely well on, on YouTube, but you don't really see Minecraft, uh, people stream Minecraft that much. Uh, and, and maybe it's just because of, I don't know, ages or whatever it might be of just like the, the audience demographics. But that piece has always been interesting to me. Mm -hmm. And and, uh, and and maybe it's, you know, there's the other side where we, we talked about esports briefly, but uh Twitch and, and and one element of Twitch or one side of Twitch is definitely more on the competitive side of uh, I want to yeah, watch the, e the best player e in the world. Are always yeah. close to the top. Yeah, yeah. Like I want to watch the best Valorant player in the world. You know, just completely crush in their games. Like that is, uh, you know, that makes sense. And and so th that piece will always do well. Whereas uh, I think you know more of the party stuff. Uh, it, it's just it's a much wider audience, um, but it, like Twitch itself might not be the best platform for that because I think a lot of people that are on Twitch are looking more of, for this like uh, specific, I don't know, best of the best, best performances. Of the best. Interesting. Yeah, it also seems to me like YouTube is maybe, and I guess to a certain extent, TikTok, although probably a little bit less, yeah, no, significantly less. YouTube, YouTube's also great, like as an educational platform. Like, like you know, I'm going to show you how to do this, right? Like, you know, whatever. Yep. You, and 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 it also seems to be a great way for people to share their thoughts and theories, right? Like, you know, I have theories about why this character did this, or I think, you know, I have theories as to like what's going on behind that locked door, that kind of stuff. So yes. there seems to be lots of opportunities for theories for kind of you know, communal storytelling, this sort of idea of like the story behind the story and kind of like exploring the, yep. the, the, the story worlds of these games in a sort of collaborative asynchronous fashion. YouTube seems to be a really good good place for that as where, as opposed to Twitch, where again, if, if you're not there when it happens, you know, you kind of missed it and it's gone, right? Yep. Mm. Um, Valheim? You you wear this one? It seems yes, to be the latest hotness. Yes. Three million couple of, as of a couple of days ago. Like I've heard of it. I think it came on my radar for the first time last week, and they're already at three million sales. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yep. Is there any sort of creator story there that you're aware of? Or is there, is there any influencer who helped make that happen? Uh, I, 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 don't I, I don't know, know. if there is a specific one, but it's definitely caught wind of the creators, and okay. uh, you know it's definitely you're seeing it streamed, you're seeing videos do really well for it. I think in my mind, 
Valheim sort of rides off. It, it, it sort of came at this really perfect time, which I, I mean, I'm sure being in gaming, you you sort of see this all the time. But like the fact that Rust was just super popular, uh, yeah. like not even a month ago, you know, yeah. and it, it it sort of parlayed very nicely into like, oh wow, there's a new game that sort of fits into the same molds that uh you know seems really hype like let's go check it out and they must have been sitting on it that timing yeah. <laughs> could not be that perfect i mean yeah come i on. mean it, it, it's it crazy feels to like watch. it must have been somehow coordinated <laughs> yeah it, it 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 is wild to watch because yeah i mean we saw we saw rust just completely take off uh not even yeah a month and a half ago two months ago and retake and, off right rust yes. was a thing and then it wasn't a, th- a thing for yeah. years and yeah, then I mean, it became rust a huge thing for, for forever you know yeah. and, and and, and uh, you know, there was always sort of the hardcore community of Rust, but yeah. it, it took back over when all the streamers started to play it. Because hey, the other piece that we should probably talk about is like, you know, these these streamers and these content creators also, you know, it is their job, and so like they they want to find things that they enjoy playing, and yes, so like yes. it helps when they find like I think Among Us and Fall Guys and Valheim and these things help make the story like they sort of help with the storytelling if that makes sense Mm -hmm. whereas uh you know some of the other games like if i'm just playing call of duty all day the storytelling is you know very repetitive whereas i think uh in fall guys and among us and valheim like the storytelling is sort of just built into the game itself and so uh it just makes it more interesting for them to like hop on stream or to record a video because there's just built-in narratives every single time that they play it yeah um, well, so talking about um, all the streamers going back to Rust, I guess <clears throat> that ties me into a question about scale. And and this, I think this question holds for either YouTube or Twitch. Yep. Again, kind of focusing on those two as the two major platforms. Um, so like, how does scale impact a product's success with content creators? Like, so as a developer, like, would I rather have a single popular, like mid-tier streamer with like a hundred thousand followers play my game for a week or or would I rather have a thousand you know small streamers with a hundred followers each play my game for a week like either way you know yep. I'm getting a hundred thousand followers watching a game for a week but is there is there a sort of like increased um benefit that comes from sort of breaking through so, uh, like, like a critical mass barrier that you see yeah I would say you know on Twitch specifically, Twitch is very top heavy uh, in that it really, uh, you know, most of the views, I mean, there's probably some data to counteract this, but like it definitely feels like the top 10 uh, streamers on Twitch sort of have a very strong foothold over the entire community. Like, you okay. know, the long tail of, uh, of streamers on Twitch, there's, you know, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of streamers on, on Twitch. But definitely the top 10 or top 100 are very dominant and they sort of shape what is, uh, I don't know, like the meta of, of, of Twitch, right? Like you're seeing uh, what, like whatever games they play sort of ride the, like you'll, you'll see people switch to those games. Like yeah. if you if you see Nick Merckx is playing uh, Call of Duty, like you're just going to see more people play Call of Duty. And, uh, and, and, and so in my mind, I think having the bigger person uh, is more valuable than having the the thousand other ones because my my gut says if you have the bigger person the ripple effects of that will be that you will have way more people streaming that game over oh, that's very a, good. a longer that's very horizon. Interesting. Yep, I buy that. Yeah, and 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 but it but it sort of sounds like what you're suggesting is that on YouTube the formula is not quite so cut and dry. Yeah, on YouTube it is a little bit more unclear, right? Like if you can find like. It, it, it's it's more tough, but I would probably say the same thing. Whereas, like, if you can find someone with a hundred thousand subscribers rather than you know doing the the thousand subscribers, because th- just the chance of that video hitting is higher if they have a hundred thousand subscribers, right. you know. Uh, and and so I think YouTube is you're only as good as your next video, and and like uh, in my mind subscribers are sort of a leading indicator that your next video is going to be good, you know? Yeah. And so uh, taking a bet on the the thousand subscriber, you know, channels is a little bit more risky because, you know, the chances of those videos actually like performing are, are pretty low. Uh, and so that's just at least my, my gut. 
Wow, man, we're already we're already at an hour and fifteen minutes, and I still have a ton no, of no, questions. No. I, um, I, I, I love this. I mean, I'm I'm happy to keep going. <laughs> You'll just go all day. <laughs> but it's a multi-parter. Exactly. <laughs> um, listen, let's let's do this. Um, uh, I, I, I'm gonna jump to these last three. Let's see if we can try and pull this in at around an hour and a half, and then okay. and let's just come back for we'll, we'll come back for a follow up, and and we'll dive deeper into some of these things. But um, so I'm going to skip a couple of questions here, um, and 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 let's talk about like um, like trying to get in the head of the creators a little bit, right? So we've okay. talked a lot about the creator culture from the point of view of the viewers, right? And like, why would we follow a creator? And like, why are we engaged with creators? And why would we give money to creators and that kind of thing? But I'd love to just pick your brains a little bit about like kind of trying to be a fly on the wall or, or inside the the shoes of these of these creators. So are there are there trends? It feels to me like you you you, you know you you relatively plugged into this group. You you know some of them, you've talked to some of them. Um, yep. are there like trends in technology, in gaming, in the platforms, are there like trends that they're like really excited about and kind of like buzzing about, would you say? Are, are, are there commonalities that get them all kind of like excited en masse? Yeah, it, it, it's a good question. I, I, I think it's right now the trend that everyone is, you know, largely excited about is just like more direct monetization or more monetization opportunities for creators. Like, mm-hmm. it, you know, there's... Fortnite, in in a lot of ways, paves the way for for a lot of different things. But the one thing that I think a lot of people overlook as sort of like the sleeper innovation that they made, uh, you know, most people would be like, you know, free to play, cross platform, whatever. But like, I think support a creator uh, or like creator codes for for Fortnite were one of like the most impactful things they could have done for just to sustainability of that ecosystem um and and if you're not familiar like the fortnite creator code is basically affiliate revenue which we talked about before but Mm -hmm. for creators to say like hey use my creator code when you check out for you know your skins and gives a kickback to that creator for promoting it and i don't know exactly what led to them you know thinking about doing it um, cause I think we see a lot and especially in games where like developers for the most part are like, okay, well we made the game and we're going to have a lot of the value accrued to them. And it was a really interesting moment where, uh, I think they realized like, wow, we should start to share some of this upside with the creators who are advertising, you know, so, all the time anyways. So, so I make, I make a Fortnite YouTube video yep. talking about, you know, whatever sick compilation of all my best headshots. Yep. And then at the end of that video, I share my creator code, which I wish I wish those creator codes were a little bit more easy to remember. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wish it was like 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 B Mattis is my creator code, but instead it's like X four nine nine two 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 whatever it is dash yep. seven. So I share my creator code. The people who watch my video think, oh slick, it's time for me to buy you know whatever. Like I need to re up my 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 battle pass or whatever. I want to buy the 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 Ryu skin. Uh, so they go to the market, they, they go to the Fortnite store, they, they buy the Ryu skin, they input my creator code yep. and I get a kickback. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and that piece, like you'll, you'll, I mean, you'll see people have their codes in their, their Twitter bios or <laughs> their TikTok videos or YouTube videos. And like that piece of loan, I think fundamentally changed the economics for creators within that world. And so I think the trend that we are seeing, you know, at large right now is creators and and just game companies alone are always like more alignment is always better right like in and and in i think the creator code for fortnite was a way to keep these creators continuing to push and create content you know like it was mm-hmm. it was finally a way for them to be like okay i'm going to continue to make content here and because i'm doing great you know and and it was sort of this win-win where like we're going to sell more skins and we're going to help our creators make money off of it. And so I think that piece was really big. And I think in general, creator monetization and like more unique ways for monetization is the trend that I think every creator is trying to think about, you know, and, and like, I think we, we might see a world where we see uh, like streamers and, and uh, I don't know, gamers just become publishers themselves right mm-hmm. like there, there's a world where you cut out you know the traditional publishers that we think of or uh and you're like okay let's just 
uh, do a deal with these 15 big streamers, you know, and, and, and have it. So they're, they're going to push out our, our game for us. And so I think though, like more alignment overall, I think is just the key for all of this. And in, in that, like, I think in the past five years, you saw a lot of uh, creators sort of not be, I don't know, as, as acknowledged by the ecosystem. And, sure. you know, like Supercell has done an incredible job of, of really nurturing and, and leaning into uh, helping out their their creators. And, and I think they've they've paved the way a lot as well. But I think it's going to just continue to be more and more of a trend. It's it's crazy. So, so rewind 10, 15 years, let's say 10 years, um, you know, as a game publisher, you, you would pay the game developer to make the game, right? You'd have some sort of yep. deal with the people who made the content or yep. and 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 then you would you would pay for marketing. You would buy, you know, whatever, <laughs> like magazine covers or or you know whatever interstitials or commercials or or whatnot. And these days you see things like, you know, core or sandbox or Roblox or whatever where the content creators are getting some sort of rev share on the, the UGC they're making, right? Like they are creating game content now and they are getting money for that. I guess probably same with the, you know, the Minecraft marketplace inside the, the Bedrock Edition. And you're, if you look at kind of Fortnite and the creator code, the marketing money is going to the content creators who are doing the job of the, you know, what we used to do in terms of magazine ads, yep. in terms of YouTube and that kind of thing. So yep. it, it is amazing how democratized, uh, you know, the sort of the economics really have become on these these kind of games. Yeah, the, game the middleman is being right? removed yeah. and, and and it's just going directly to these creators themselves. And, and, you know, they're the ones who have the audience, right? Like if you just view it as like a pure, like creators have audience and you need audience, it's like align yourself with those people, you know, yeah. uh, no, is, totally. is the way that I view it. Yeah. Okay, so two more questions. Um, uh, what do you think people don't get about creators? Um, do you think, like, again, trying to put your hat, you know, your, your, your Mr. Beast hat on or, you know, whatever, your Preston hat on, like, what do you think they wish the viewers knew and understood? And what do you think there's maybe something different that they wish the game makers understood? Like, uh, hmm. do you think they've got a message for, for, for their audience or for the developers of the content that, that, that you yeah. you can speak to i think i think they're most creators that i talk to are, are actually pretty humble specifically just around the amount of work that goes into their content like okay. i think no one no one really understands how much work <laughs> uh it goes in behind the scenes to make these videos right yeah. like you know preston is is uploading to five different channels multiple times a week and you know, that's an insane level of, of output. And I think most people sort of just watch, you know, especially the kids who are watching it, like they're, they're never going to really think about how much work went into it. And they're just going to think like, okay, this is uh, just a pure, like, this is just fun. You know, like mm -hmm. they're going, they're getting paid to play Roblox, you know, yeah, exactly. uh, but it is a job. And, and I think, uh, you know, Mr. Beast, you know, he's spending hundred thousand two hundred thousand dollars on a video and yes there is in, in his mind there is a feeling of like okay it will perform well but it's the same as you know when a when a game studio uh has a previous hit and they're like okay we're gonna spend a bunch of money on on the next one and and hope that it hits and and i think uh i think a lot of people just don't realize how much work is going on behind the scenes like i mean mr b spends you know, three weeks, four weeks on a video, you know, and, wow. and it's like has a like he has a full team around him, you know, like he has a uh, production team, editors, like they're, they're, it's a full business. And I think that side of this world is uh, largely under discussed, you know, mm -hmm. and 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 uh, and I think it's just more like they it's more that what we were talking about at the very beginning of this podcast, where a lot of people who are looking at this space sort of just view it as like, okay, these are just like a bunch of kids making videos and like uh, they're not like grateful or whatever it might be. But I think it's quite the opposite. I think it's, they're just largely misunderstood and that uh, a couple bad actors of, of influencers over the years uh, sort of just, you know, made it, uh, like made the entire industry have a bad rap. But I think we are like getting to a closer point where it's, it's been cleaned up quite a bit. That's cool. All right. And, and so normally the last question that I do on the 
podcast, uh, I ask people to kind of like whatever predict, you know, five years in the future, try and predict how blah, blah, blah is, is, is going to have shaped your industry. I want to do something slightly different with you. Um, so when I grow up, I'm going to be a YouTuber. We've said it at least three times on this podcast, right? How many times have you heard that in the last five years? It is the new, it's, it's the new dream job, right? Kids don't want to be doctors and lawyers anymore. They want to yep. be YouTubers. So there's going to be parents listening to this who are probably going to be shaking their heads thinking, I'll be <laughs> damned if I let my kid grow up to become a YouTuber, right? Yep. Um, you know, what do you have to say to these parents whose kids in five years may or may not actually be the next generation of creators? Yep. Yeah. I, I mean, I would say encourage it because I think there is, you know, for the most part, they're not going to get views. Like I, like I, uh, I think most people who are creating content in, and I say this as someone who's, you know, has their own podcast and their own YouTube channel, like it's a grind. And, you know, I think it's a good learning experience for someone who wants, who, who claims they want to be a YouTuber or a streamer to understand like how much work it is, you know, and, and, and go through the motions of like trying to stream several times a week, you know, <laughs> like, uh, and, and try and make it entertaining. I think, uh, it, it's a large part of it is just like studying though and understanding what is, what are the trends that are popular and, um, why are those trends popular? And so I, I think to the parents, like, I, I think it, it is a real, you know, career path. And I think we're going to see more and more of this over time where, the individuals just have a lot of power and, you know, you might have a, a child who wants to be a scientist one day, but instead of doing research papers, they might just make educational videos and uh, that might just be a way more lucrative and better path for them as, as an individual. Uh, and so I think it's just a matter of like getting them comfortable if they actually want to do it uh, and seeing if they can stick with it. Because I think yeah, I, if you told me like um, when I wanted to be a professional gamer back in the day to make content regularly on YouTube, I would have been like, no chance. Like, even though I wanted to, uh, I would have flaked immediately because I just wasn't that you know determined. But I think the the kids that are determined are going to just like make videos continually and uh, upload to no one, you know, and, and get right. comfortable yeah. with uploading to no audience one. of one, and it's okay because they're passionate about the experience. Yes, yeah, exactly. That's cool. All right. Awesome. Well, uh, dude, <laughs> this has been fascinating. I think we have material for probably at least one, if not two more. Uh, I can't wait to continue the conversation. But for now, thank you very, very much for sharing your time and thoughts uh, with me uh, on this podcast. It's been, it's been fascinating. I've had a blast. Yeah, thank you for having me on. And that's a wrap for yet another episode of the Tomorrow with Rovio podcast. Uh, I want to really thank Blake for taking the time. He was incredibly gracious uh, with his time, with his information, with his insight, uh, his stories uh, deep from the trenches of the world of content creators and YouTube creators and streamers. Entertaining, engaging, fascinating, eye-opening. I hope you got out as much out of it as I did. And again, if, if this is the sort of thing you're interested in, uh, please do, you know, whatever, uh, like or subscribe or, or, or just comment. Send us an email, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, however you, you want to get in touch with us, um, please do. Um, it puts a smile on my face, even if you're saying nasty stuff. Uh, so just reach out and let us know. Thanks a lot. Have a great one. Talk to you soon.